Welcome to the Brent School Community Colloquium. Our guest speaker today is Steve Blank, and I wanted to do a quick introduction and brief overview of our eco-entrepreneurship program here at the Brent School. My name is Emily Chan, and I am a lecturer here and academic advisor. Uh, and just to give you a little background on eco-entrepreneurship, or what we call eco-e, it's a relatively new focus at the school. It was started in 2007 by Gary Leibcap, who is a professor here at Bren, but he's on sabbatical this year in London. Uh, he started it in collaboration with the technology management program at our College of Engineering here at UCSB. Um, it's become a really, really popular program here at, at uh, the Bren School. And we have seven specializations that are really in environmental areas. But the eco-e focus can be added uh, on top of any of the seven specializations. I like to call it a power boost, really, to <laughs> for lack of a better academic term. But it is a focus, um, which the students take some curriculum, uh, as well as work on projects that are considered group projects and serve as the master's thesis here at the Bren School. Um, part of the, the the ECOE project is to develop a business plan. And in the past, we took a very traditional approach, you know, really, really focusing on writing the plan. And thanks to Steve Blank uh, and all the materials that he makes available through his blog and through his textbook, we've really changed the perspective to focus more on business model development and less on just writing a business plan. Uh, so today you'll hear a lot about Steve's customer development model, which has helped us so much here uh, in shifting our perspective and helping the students really focus on how do I find a customer in a market before I just go ahead and develop a product that maybe fundamentally nobody wants. Uh, so that's a really big, uh, important shift uh, in the eco-e focus here. Uh, as well as getting our students to focus on financial sustainability for their ventures. Um, it's important that we focus on moving towards an environmentally sustainable society, but we think that they'll be able to accomplish that better when they're building ventures that have also a focus on becoming financially sustainable. Uh, so that's a little bit about our EcoE program and the impact that Steve Blank has had on it. Uh, to give you a little background on Steve, uh, he spent 21 years at high technology companies, eight different companies. Uh, his last company that he co-founded is called Epiphany, which was one of the success stories of the dot-com bubble era. Uh, he retired in 1999 and wrote Four Steps to the Epiphany, which we use as our textbook in class. Uh, for the last 10 years, he's been teaching at Stanford in the Technology Ventures Program, as well as at UC Berkeley at the Haas School where he received last year an Outstanding Teacher Award. He also teaches in the joint program for the executive MBAs at Columbia. It's a joint program between Berkeley and Columbia. Um, and as many of you know in this room, he serves on the Coastal Commission for California, which is why we're so fortunate to have him in town this week and invited him to come speak at the Brent School. So please join me in welcoming Steve Blank. Yep. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm honored to be here in uh, one of the best and brightest schools uh, in California. A um, couple things about my background, what Emily was kind enough uh, not to tell you, is that out of my eight startups, two left craters so deep they have their own iridium layer. They'll be digging up 65 million years from now as well, which was one of the things that actually I think make great entrepreneurs. Is only in blogs and stories do entrepreneurs go from success to success. Actually, it's learning from the failures that I think make you a much better entrepreneur. And we'll talk about that story today. Now, first, uh, I want to acknowledge Klaus Schauser. Klaus, of, uh, CEO of Affolio, why don't you raise your hand. Uh, Klaus was the first guy south of San Jose uh, to ever figure out that the customer development book was worth reading in 2004 before I even decided that. And, uh, um, he just gave me a tour of his company at Folio, and it was great to see all the customer development archetypes and processes uh, um, on the wall. So there is a model here in Santa Barbara. Klaus, among others, are, uh, have adopted the methodology and built an amazing company out of it. Uh, two is just to, for the purpose of this talk, if I look a little dazed, uh, two reasons. 
I just drove down and literally got out of the car. And two is as I was standing outside, my daughter called me from college in the east and said, Dad, I just want to tell you I'm going skydiving on Sunday. <laughs> um, seriously, no joke. A and I'm not going to tell Mom, but I thought you'd understand. <laughs> and I said, Sarah, <laughs> you're above 18. These are the kind of things you tell your parents after you jump out of the plane. And she, she nailed me. She said, well, Dad, since you did it when you were 19, I thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> so much for telling your kids stories. Remember, never tell them the truth till the 30. Um, so I thought we'd get started. Um, I write a blog, steveblank.com. If you want to see um, some, not only uh, things I've been thinking about since the text, The Four Steps to the Epiphany, actually how to explain it in English is mostly what the blog's about, but also some war stories about how I came up with actually um, the principles in the book. They just didn't come full blown. They, they really were hard learned, painful lessons of how to get it wrong through eight startups. And I share them in the, there's a co uh, categories column on the left and you could uh, read some of them. Um, a couple of years ago I drew this, Four Steps. Uh, I called it Customer Development. It ended up with this book, Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, North Dakota is the only state that's banned the cover. Truly. Uh, I had a professor from some state in North Dakota say, uh, you know, our uh, faculty, curriculum, whatever, won't approve the cover. I said, it's the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> and they went, what's that? And I went, you know, uh, the book probably won't work in North Dakota anyway. So, so a couple of people have read it in a couple of locations. This won the photo award last year of weirdest places I've seen the book. Um, and the talk is based on not only my stuff, which is... Um, I consider a perfect example of stream of consciousness turgid text, um, and though some people have been known to get through, of it, through it. But there's actually uh, two other books that if you're thinking about customer development, agile, lean startups, um, we'll be talking about his material in the middle of this book, but Alexander Osterwalder's Business Model Generation book is really now, I think, a got to have on your shelf, and you'll see why in a second. And Eric Reese, uh, one of my students, and uh, somebody who's now the Johnny Appleseed of Lean Startups and really added uh, some uh, uh, immense thinking uh, to this process, is writing a book that's going to come out this fall as well. So um, I just want to share with you a couple of thoughts today the, based on a couple of premises. I think we're at the beginning of another tech bubble, first in web and mobile apps. And then what's interesting, I think, for Bren here is clean tech may follow. And I'll explain to you my thinking. Um, also, that rules are different in a bubble than they are in normal times. And so the question is, what are those rules and how they differ from what you did before? But I think it's maybe worth starting at the beginning. First, what's a startup? Now, when I started teaching, I knew what a startup was. I was an entrepreneur. I did it for 20 years. Of course I know what a startup was. And so they were nice enough to have me sit and teach with someone else. And they said, sit in this guy's classroom, watch how he teaches. And his first definition was, what's a startup? And I thought maybe I had lost the command of the English language, because his definition had nothing to do with what I had done for 20 years. And then, all right, maybe it's just this guy or me or something. So I sat in another classroom. Completely different definition. And what I realized is we don't even agree on what a startup is. So I'm going to give you Steve's taxonomy of startups, and then we could describe about why is it important to know this and do we do anything different between each one of them. Now, small businesses are startups. Let me explain what small business is. My parents were immigrants to the United States. They came over to the U.S. in the 1920s in steerage on the bottom of a boat into New York Harbor, past the Statue of Liberty. They didn't even have to pay for the tour because they ended up in Ellis Island. They ended up working in the Lower East Side of New York in garment factories and sweatshops, and they swore after they met that someday they were going to work for themselves. They were going to open up a grocery store, which was the promised land for immigrants in the United States. And after 10 years of saving money, they did. They were going to serve known customers, their neighbors, with a known product, food they knew they would want. And they were doing it, most importantly, not to take over the universe, or even to take over the grocery business, or even to set up a grocery chain in New York. Their goal was to feed the family. 
And so their exit criteria was looking for a business model, though they didn't, never would describe it that way. They were looking for something that said, wait a minute, if we stock these foods, people would buy from us, and we can make a profit on it. And we'll use our existing team, which was my mother and father, and us, I think the height criteria is when we wouldn't fall into the pickle barrel and drown, we got to stock the shelves. Right? And if they made a million dollars their entire lives, I'm probably exaggerating by, you know, 800,000 bucks. Small businesses, it turns out, are the backbone of the United States. There are 5.7 million small businesses that employ close to 50% of non-governmental workers. They make up 99.7% of all companies. Now let me be clear, my parents were entrepreneurs. When they left the sweatshops in New York, they did do a startup. But the word startup to them means something very different than it means to the rest of us. In fact, this definition of startup, small businesses. What are some other small business startups? What's another small business startup? You can have a lifeline. Point to somebody else. Yes, good, right. But small coffee shop, what else? Laundromat, what else? A diner. Diner, what else? We're all talking about food. It must be dinner time. <laughs> what else? Garage, right? Yeah. Consultants, small businesses, right? Those are all small businesses. By the way, in Silicon Valley, there's a pejorative term for these. Do you know what they're called? You may ever hear the term lifestyle businesses? Oh, these are lifestyle businesses. Like with disdain. I mean, you've got to practice this. Disdain, you know, lifestyle. Actually, these are normal people, right? It's the people in Silicon Valley who are insane, right? But these are normal people who want to make a living, don't want to work for someone else. They do startups. And in fact, outside of technology centers, when you say startup and entrepreneur, people are thinking of these people. Make sense? Another type of entrepreneur, kind of clustered in Stanford, Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, University of Michigan, universities in areas with great social consciousness. And those are social entrepreneurial startups. Startups that either want to do two things. They want to build profitable social enterprises. That is, they want to make money but by doing good. Or they want to do social innovation for nonprofits, new strategies. These are also startups. These are also entrepreneurs, but very different from small business, correct? Third type, believe it or not, large companies do innovate. I know it's hard to believe. Anybody ever work at a large company? <laughs> Welcome. Um, large companies do innovation two ways. 15 years ago, a professor at Harvard named Clayton Christensen really got it right. He said, listen, in the life cycle of a large company, they end up doing innovations around their core products. Anybody ever use Microsoft Word? Right? right? Word version 47 with footnotes and reverse Polish notation right, is sustaining innovation. No one else could do that as well than Microsoft. Google. Anybody ever use Google? Right? What's their core business? Search core business. Google owned the web until three and a half years ago. Something happened to Google completely out of their control. What happened? Facebook. Facebook is disruptive innovation to an existing company. Google owned the web. Facebook invented or at least managed to scale social networking in a way that Google never could. By the way, Half of Facebook's employees used to work at Google, just to tell you the impact it had. Google, who was an innovative company, now is faced with something outside of their core technology. And they have to deal with new markets, new technologies, new customers, potentially new channels. Large companies deal with disruptive innovation in two ways. They either try to build it, wasn't that Google Buzz, right, or something? Names we don't even know of products that they tried. Or they tried to acquire it. You could acquire intellectual property. You could acquire talent. You could acquire product or customers or business. And so large companies, when they have to deal with disruptive innovation, 
all of a sudden have to be a startup inside. Make sense? That's the third type of startup. Fourth type, what I call scalable startups. A scalable startup is founders who decide to solve for unknown customers, unknown features, and wake up in the morning and say, the universe is mine. I am going to conquer the world, and you're just in my way. Lead, follow, or get the heck out of the way. Scalable startups are what we do in Silicon Valley and in other technology clusters, whether in clean tech or web or mobile or biotech. A scalable startup has the funny characteristic of you're looking for a business model, but your goal is not to be the company on the left, but to be the company on the right. The startup is used to search for a business model so you could grow to a large company and make a ton of money. Make sense? Funny characteristic about a scalable startup is unlike a small business or unlike social entrepreneurship, perhaps, certainly unlike a large company, scalable startups typically need risk capital to grow. What's a risk capital? Anybody know? What's a risk capital? All right, venture capital. Venture capital. By the way, in the 1950s, when they first came up with the term, it was called adventure capital. And people on Wall Street said, you know, that word maybe won't work on Wall Street, and it's before the housing bubble. Um, you know, and so they shortened it and called it venture capital. Venture capital is attracted to scalable startups, not attracted to small business, and not attracted to social entrepreneurship. Why not? Why doesn't, why doesn't venture, how much better? A minimum. What kind of return does a VC need? Huge. Obscene is the answer. Now, truly, an obscene return. If you ask a traditional venture capitalist, they look at every deal that they invest in is, could it return by itself half to the entire fund? a $500 million fund, I want to know that this deal itself could return massive amounts of money. So therefore, if I'm a small business, it might be great. I'm saying, why can't I get any investors? I'm going to make a million bucks a year. Not attract, even though it might be attractive to you personally, it's not attractive to scale. Does that make sense? And, and that kind of like answers a lot of questions of consultants going, but I got this great business. How come they keep sending me to banks? Because your investment versus return just doesn't make sense for this class of startup. All the startups you read about, either from clean tech, biotech, mobile, web apps, social networks, all kind of fall under this scalable startups class. Now, of course, in Silicon Valley, we don't put the word scalable there. I do, just to differentiate it. That makes sense. Um, by the way, venture capital-backed scalable startups are 13% of all public companies, 4% of total sales of U.S. All of public companies, equaled about a trillion dollars in revenue. That's its contribution to the economy. Now, you notice that over scalable startup on the left, it says search, and over large company, it says execute. Oh, by the way, there's one other startup. We'll talk about that in a sec. One other startup, which I just kind of will call a buyable startup. Not a scalable startup, but a buyable startup. Anybody doing web or mobile apps? I know clean tech, but anybody in the room web or mobile? Right? Unless your goal is to be a billion dollar company, kind of hard on the iPhone, but possible. Right? The goal is to solve for internet and mobile apps and sell to a larger company for you know, a couple million bucks to 50 million. That's a new class of startup that has only been available in the last three to five years, I'd say the last three years, because of a shift in technology that's never been seen before. And for the clean tech guys, you could take a nap here for a second, but it's really important. The world of commerce has shifted like it's never have before. It is possible that in the next couple of years, the total available market, that is the total potential customers for web and mobile apps, can be measured in billions of people. 
Anybody know how many customers Facebook has today? 600 million customers. More than any other company combined 10 years ago. Every other company combined. That will, will not be an anomaly five years from now. There will be tens if not hundreds of companies with customers measured in hundreds of millions. So that's why viable startups are uh, going to be another class. So what's a startup? My definition on the right, excuse me, on the left, is a startup is a temporary organization used to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. This is interesting. Because after seeing all these types of startups, we can now put together a sentence that's worth parsing. One is, it's a temporary organization. The goal is not to be a startup. Might seem obvious, but to some companies still having you know, beer on Fridays for the last 15 years, probably not. The goal is not to stay in the box on the left, but to become the box on the right. And since it's a temporary organization, what's it good for? Well, it's used to search. That's interesting. Because startups are organizations full of people who know how to do something unique that large companies have long forgotten. And that is to search for a business model. And we'll define what a business model is in a couple more slides. But you want a business model that's repeatable and scalable. I add more sales and marketing dollars, and revenue or users or something goes up consistent with that input. Make sense? Now, startup search, companies execute, but wait a minute, there's a new box in the center. And that new box called the transition is a secret. Don't tell anybody. Don't, don't tell anybody, because it's the secret memo that venture capitalists never tell you. That box in the middle is both happy and sad. You would think that as a founder, when you found that business model, when you and your team finally found a way to get sales or users or revenue to go up at your board meeting where you and your board agree, you're standing there waiting for them to pin the medal right here. Say, just put it right here, please, or just hang it around my neck. And by the way, the parade will start in the cubicle to the left, and don't throw the confetti too hard. But instead, that's not what's going on. The day you start finding your business model, all of a sudden, your board members start looking at you in a way that's making you very uncomfortable, actually, because they're looking at you up and down. Why are they doing that? Why are they looking at you? No, you just, you just succeeded. Why are they looking at you? Why? I just succeeded. Uh, why? I just led. Why? I did search great. Didn't I do search great? Say it again. Right. You're, yeah, you're both in sync, right? You were trading notes. Big idea. This is what happens in a startup, and the founders never get this memo. In fact, with my VC friends, I go, why don't we just tell founders? And they go, Steve, are you crazy? If we're the only one not lying to them, they won't take our money. Don't laugh. What really happens is this is the stage where you build the company. And this is where investors now smell money. Where before, they were happy for you to, I mean, you really have to fail egregiously as a founder to be removed while you're searching for the business model. It's ironic that once you start succeeding, your odds of staying are actually less. Because what they're now looking for is an, what's called an operating executive. Somebody with experience in transitioning the company into repeatable bureaucracy and process and the things needed to grow a company. By the way, as an aside, since you're not my class, I won't make you raise your hand. But uh, what I usually do <coughs> in my classes is ask, how many students have come from dysfunctional families? <coughs> People, Whoa, what, where's that from? And then I remind them that founders who come from dysfunctional families have for the first time in their lives a disproportionate advantage in the search phase. Huge advantage. Why? <coughs> Excuse me. Because 
They've been capable of operating in chaos and noise and have practiced in shutting out all the stuff that gets in their way. Survivors of dysfunctional families turn out to be close to 50% of successful CEOs in Silicon Valley. And I always get questions, well, okay, but, but, I, but I don't come from that family. Is it okay? Can I still be a, yes, it's okay. I'm just reminding you, for, don't raise your hands, you actually have an advantage until it gets here, and then you make it worse. What happens with people who love chaos and it now becomes predictable? What do you think they do? Create more chaos. Whoa. If you ever worked for a boss like this, it, it, it's kind of predictive of behavior, is they'll get here, and really they should be looking at how to build organizations, and they're more comfortable creating chaos, just as an aside. <coughs> so a few short stories. How did we get here? From 1970 to 1995, you had to build the company to be successful. We took a break from that in 1995 and had something called the Internet Bubble. It was actually the clean tech bubble and biotech bubble and network bubble. And then from 2001 through 2010, we had to learn to build companies again, which we've been doing. As I said, my prediction is we're about to enter another bubble uh, depending on your technology segment, maybe um, early this year or maybe now, maybe uh, later this year. Um, let me just describe how startups used to work and where we are today. You used to have a build a business. Building a business meant you needed millions of dollars to start a company. You needed to buy proprietary hardware and software. Believe it or not, to even start work, you needed to buy workstations or mini computers and millions of dollars of software. If your product development cycle was long, you used something called waterfall development. You spec'd all the features, and then you went away and worked, and 18 months later to sometimes years, you came out with a product. In business-to-business -business sales, you had thousands of customers. You made money through an initial public offering, but there was no repeatable methodology. You actually acted like a smaller version of a big company. Uh, the goal here, though, was long-term company success. The venture capitalists and the founders were company builders. You were actually learning how to build the company. The exits, that is how you made money, were public offerings. And a success, a world-class success for both a venture capitalist and a founder, you made $10 million your entire career. That was all right. By the way, the playbook, you know, how you learned and what you executed, was the business plan. That's what everybody learned. We did it in big companies. Thank you so much. Um, we'll do it in startups. By the way, the product introduction model looked like this. You had a concept, you raised a seed round, you went into product development, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. Anybody ever see this? diagram before. I used to joke that either, even the waiters in San Francisco could draw this until somebody raised this hand and said, well, uh, Professor Blank, we're waiters in San Francisco because we used to be dot-com CEOs. And <laughs> so I said I no longer made that, make that joke, but I lied. Um, it turned out, though, that this diagram was actually the leading cause of death. Interesting. It was the leading cause of startup death because in it were two implicit assumptions of founders. Remember, founding a company, anybody ever found a company or start one yet? All right. Founding a company is a complete act of will. I mean, no one believes you. You've got to get resources, people, money, etc. It's a faith-based enterprise on day one. It is an act of faith and creation. The problem is, because it's an act of faith, we used to make the mistake that said, because I have the vision, therefore, I understand the customer problem. And this is where startups went wrong from day one. It's my vision. I get it. I'm pulling together the team. I know what we're going to go do. And so then, not only did we know the problem, we'd sit inside the building and spec all the features that our product will have without ever getting outside. And then we would do that, and then we'd start hiring. We'd hire marketing people to create Marcom material and hire a PR agency and get ready for the launch event. Launches were big deals to marketeers. 
We'd hire a sales VP to start hiring the sales force because that first customer ship, we'd want a sales organization to make the revenue plan. We'd hire biz dev people whose role I still don't understand 20 years later. And then we'd hire engineers and, and a VP of engineering, if they weren't a co-founder, to write the market requirements document, go into waterfall development. And I could always tell whether we're still following this model as I ask people, do you have any QA or tech pubs people? You're doomed. And I see people sending text messages, fire tech pubs. That's, you know, that's not the way to solve this problem, but this was the traditional model. We did this for 25 years. It literally was a duplicate of what we did in large corporations. The problem is, is that you really never learned about customers till here. You maybe gave it lip service, but Boy, engineering was off executing the product features that the founders believed in. The problem is, is that even for companies with technology risk, most startups fail from a lack of customers than from a failure of product development. Big idea. Big idea. For those of you who are engineers, any engineers in the room? Don't feel good. Your product's never on time. Um, but the, but the companies don't go out of business because of that. They go out of business because the product didn't attract enough customers and didn't make enough money. Hold that thought. Just as we were about to figure that out, in August 1995, the world ended for building companies. Completely ended. Anybody know what happened in August 1995? No, that, that, set, that actually set the world back at least 20 years. What else happened in August 1995? I, I, I actually think uh, that Windows was a, was a leftover plot from the Soviet Union to destroy our economy. Yes? Netscape. Netscape. What about Netscape? It went public. It went public. August 1995. Proved that there was a market at insane valuation for a company with very little revenue and no profit. And everybody needed to own stock with something that said internet or dot com. And in these five years, what we now call the dot com bubble, it now instead of millions of dollars to start, cost tens of millions of dollars because you not only still had to buy hardware and software, but you had to spend tens of millions of dollars creating a brand. There was an idea of first mover advantage which turned out to be a trillion dollar science experiment that was wrong, but that you had to go do this at the time. The product development cycles were still long, but Netscape figured out how to make customers into their quality assurance department by shipping betas. Uh, but for the first time, we had millions of customers, and liquidity were now large and crazy initial public offering, and there was a repeatable methodology, but none that we'd ever want to admit today because we'd be indicted you know, brand hype and flip your company, meaning, you know, just sell it or, you know, take it public and quickly get out of it. Um, the goal was short-term exits, and venture capitalists were no longer building companies. Big idea. Venture capitalists were engineering financial transactions. Not bad, not evil, not anything. It just was. They were responsible to their investors, and the best way to make money in this period was not to build a company. It was to make some financial game out of it. Most of them got rich. Founders hyped their company, and this was musical chairs. The last one standing looked dumb, but everyone else got absurdly rich and ended up teaching. Um, the playbook was this document, one you probably haven't seen in the last 10 years, but this is a, a stock offering document. You used to find them in street corners, right? Now you can't find them at all, but we'll see them again. When the bubble crashed, which is March in 2000, venture capitalists spent three years truly sorting through rubble. Rubble was companies that were, had burn rates that were unsustainable, that couldn't go public, that you know, had no real technology, that um, just couldn't make it. But we learned something in this last decade. We learned how to build companies again, but this time much smarter. And so here's where we are today. It now takes, for some class of companies, less than half a million dollars to start. Clean tech, cheaper, but not at the half a million dollar mark, has other problems I'll talk about in the Q&A section. Uh, but for software, 
There's a whole new world here. Open source, commodity hardware and software, short product development cycle, agile development. We now have hundreds of millions of customers. Unbelievable. More customers than every other company combined. That's what Facebook has. Liquidity, that is how a company makes money or gets, uh, makes money for its investors. Companies were sold in the last 10 years. The IPO market kind of shut down. You couldn't take a company public, but lots of large companies were buying. And we started to find out what the real rules were about building startups. And this is huge. We truly found that startups actually could be engineered in a way to reduce early stage risk. And that's agile and customer development, which we'll talk about in a second. But what we understood is that startups were not small versions of large companies. So let me show you why. Startups searched for a business model. Large companies execute a known business model. Walmart executes in every one of its stores. 50 years ago, Sam Walton was finding a business model. After he found it, he didn't want to mess it up. We're going to build store after store after store that looks like this. Large companies do traditional accounting. Am I taking accounting here? Anybody? Yeah. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. You can't run a modern company without knowing this top to bottom. Now, I have to tell you, for 20 years I'd do startups. In my first board meeting, they'd say, prepare your financials. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Okay, here they are, stack of paper, push it across the table. Venture capitalists sitting on the other side looking like your investors. Income statement, month one, what do you think it said? What do you think it said? How much money did I make month one? Zero. Okay, but the paper looked great, didn't it? Okay. I got a CFO doing this, by the way. All right. Month two, prepare the documents. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Push them across the table. What did it say? Zero. Okay, but the paper, they was formatted perfectly. Right? Fonts were great, etc. This went on maybe for 18 months. And then finally, income statement said $12. Now, this may or may not sound screwy to you, but this was great to do in a large company. It's insane to do in a startup. In the first year or so, when you're searching for a business model, there's only two or three numbers that matter in a startup. What are they? Anybody know? What are now for cash? What's what are the numbers? Burn rate, which means what? Great. What else? If you had any, what else? What does that mean? Great. What else do you really care about? You bet. You bet. So burn rate, how much money you have left? And I actually wanted to know what day of the month do we hit the ground and leave the smoking crater? All right, that's when you're out of money. Usually, whatever day that was, I managed to extend it for nine more months by like moving things around. But eventually, those are the numbers you need to know for financials, Steve's version. But what you really need to know and what you really want to have a discussion with your board about are all the metrics you're using to search for your business model. Now, this just happened to be for some hypothetical internet ones. Don't write these down like they're some golden rule. But in your board meeting, you, the discussion for a value add with a board about numbers are not about income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. They're about the metrics that you guys are using to understand whether a business is doing well. Make sense? Sales. Large corporations, VPs of sales, world-class people. Anybody know how tall a VP of sales is? 6'2". How'd you know that? Yep, 6'2". Actually, I would have said 6'3". Color hair? Yeah, silver hair. Select back. Somebody's writing that down. Get silver hair. Right? <laughs> Golf score? You know, low. In a large corporation, a VP of sales knows how to hire and put together a sales force that knows how to sell world-class to make the revenue plan off of price lists and data sheets. In a startup, you don't even know what the product is. Yet we use the same titles, VP of sales, VP of sales, 
and are always surprised when the VP of sales that gets hired from a large company melts down in an early stage venture. It turns out the title's the same, the job description is completely different. Engineering, large corporation, they better know how to do waterfall development. Some are moving to Agile. In a startup, if they're doing waterfall development, you're out of business. You want to be thinking about Agile and incremental engineering. Business plans. Business plans are wonderful documents for large companies. They explain what you're doing next. But in a startup, you don't know what you're doing next. You want to use something called the business model, which I'll explain in a minute. So 2001 through 2010, the IPL market was closed. As I said, the way to make money was uh, through mergers. Uh, you built for the long term, but investors were having companies take short term uh, offers. But founders actually learned customer development, agile development, and lean startup skills. And the focus was truly on building customers with minimum hype. And the playbook in this decade was my book and agile engineering books and some other stuff. But we were still using this, the business plan. Let me list all the things the business plan is great for in a startup. OK, let's move on. All right. uh, this is another leading cause of death. Anyone ever write a business plan for a startup? Yeah? Where'd you come up with the numbers? You guessed. You guessed. Anybody else? All right. I actually believe, in fact, we should start this rumor today, is that there's a secret set of Easter egg command keys in Excel that will auto-generate 100 million in five years, right? And because that's what they all seem to say. Here's the problem. This is no joke. No business plan survives first contact with customers in a startup. It doesn't. It's just creative writing. So instead of just saying, don't do that, let me tell you what the substitute is. You want to search for a business model. A business model, and this is Osterwalder's work, says, listen, we've used that word business model for the last 20 years. Get three professors in a room, you come out with 12 definitions. So here's a better way to describe a business model, because it will help after these nine slides. Business model starts with who are your customers? What do they want you to do for them? Not what do you want to sell them, but what do they want done? What's your value proposition? That's a $10 word for what are you building? Right? Fancy word get to use it in school, but outside it would be, what are we building? What product or service or features? What channel are we using, web or physical? And inside, direct sales, or are we using affiliate models? What's, what's the distinction? How are we getting and keeping customers? Even though we call it customer relationships, it really is, how's you, how do you get, keep, or grow customers? And how do we make money? Is it a freemium model? Is it a you know, OEM sale, et cetera? These, by the way, are the five most important things a startup needs to know almost on day one. But ultimately, you also need to know what resources do you need, what activities do you need to do, do you need any partners, and what's the resulting cost structure? When you put that all together, you could then now just kind of turn it on its edge and make what's called out, called the business model canvas. You could download this from the web, and you could sketch out with yellow stickies your business model. But realize that even after you do that, that's the good news. The bad news is even after you do that, you now have a canvas with just hypotheses. By the way, what does the word hypotheses mean outside of a university? What's hypotheses? You're, you're just effing guessing, right? I mean, you're guessing. Even though we got, oh, great, we now use this canvas and whatever, it's wonderful, we're guessing. So here's the big idea. You had to sit through 45 minutes to get to this. You ready? It's really helpful to draw out your business model. But to really know whether it's a guess or a fact is you want to search 
for the business model outside your building. And the process of searching is called customer development. And that's where the founders get outside the building and now test each of those business model boxes one at a time and try to understand who are our customers? What do they want? What do we think we're selling? Do, is there a match? No, what's the channel? What's the pricing model? And we do this with this four-step model. Customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and company building. Customer discovery, the first step, says we're going to stop selling and start listening, and we're going to test the hypotheses continuously outside the building. We're going to do this with the founders, and we're going to take this business model diagram, and as I said, each box at a time, get outside and start asking questions in a methodical way. Now, the first two steps, customer discovery and customer validation, equals learning. Instead of guessing what a customers want or how much should they pay, you're now going to know them as facts. And there's three key ideas in these first steps something called the minimum viable product, the pivot, and cycle time. Minimum viable product says you are not going to build your entire product on day one. You're going to try to figure out what the smallest feature set is. Is it hardware? Is it software? Is it a PowerPoint slide? Is it a web mock-up? Is it some real code? And you're going to try to figure out do I want to get orders or learning or feedback? Or you're going to do something with that minimum viable product. You want to learn. The minimum viable product and who the customer are are the first two things you need to get right. But just remember, there's, it's only kind of one out of the nine boxes of your model. The second thing about customer development is just astonishing. Not astonishing that I'm going to show you. It's, it's astonishing that this was something that was hidden in plain sight. Anybody know what would happen to a VP of sales of a startup who didn't make their revenue plan? What would happen in a board meeting? What happens? I think everybody, and this is the old days, say 1998. Sorry? Fire them fast. Right, fire, you're fired. Didn't make the plan. Why would that happen? Who said that? Yeah, you get to answer the second part. That's the prize for answering the first part. Yeah, why? So why fire him? Yeah, what was the expectation? Yeah, why? Where did the expectation come from? Right, and where did the plan come from? Who? Who's that? You're right, did the board do the plan in a startup? Founders did the plan. Board invested in it, right? Now, by the way, does anybody know how many boards a typical Silicon Valley VC sits on? 8 to 12. So every month, you're seeing one VC. They're seeing 12 of you. Here's the joke. When they were in 12 board meetings, I'd say 11.9 of them were saying, we didn't make the plan. You were thinking it was just you who was failing. It turns out for 40 years, the plan never actually worked. And VCs, every time it didn't work, would act surprised. We're surprised, we're shocked, you're the failure. Instead of saying, well, wait a minute. Failure is an integral part of a startup. In fact, we fail often, most often. How come we don't have a feedback loop that instead of wasting time creating crisis and firing executives, we simply learn and say, oh, I got our assumptions about the business model were incorrect. That's the second part of this. That's that feedback loop. It's the heart of customer development. It's called the pivot. It's iteration without crisis. Specific definition is any time you change one of those, one or more of the business model boxes, you've just done a pivot. And it's OK. And startups are allowed to pivot if you're not burning a ton of cash until you figure out what the model is. And how you're not burning a ton of cash is that the speed of this cycle matters. The speed of the cycle minimizes cash burn. The minimum feature set speeds up the cycle. 
And near instantaneous customer feedback drives the feature set. So let me, uh, to close, uh, show you how this really works. I want to take uh, a couple of examples from uh, my class that were actually not just web whatever, but actually a couple of eco things. So this is a class I just taught called the Lean Launchpad at Stanford. Students had eight weeks, eight weeks. Take a product, build it, go get orders. Orders. Okay. First one were his first idea, or their team's first idea, was residential wind turbines. They talked to 100 customers outside the building in eight weeks. Their initial idea was to build an affordable wind turbine that went in backyards of houses. I couldn't keep a straight face when they said that, but OK. So it's from the engineering school, and all right. And so their first business model, Canvas, said, we're going after single family homeowners. So here they took that Osterwalder Canvas, wrote out their hypothesis, and said, listen, it's faster payback than you know, solar, um, and we're going to have a direct sales force that does this. And uh, you know, we're going to need some new regulations. We'll just knock that off at city councils. And you know, I'm trying to keep it. Really? OK. You know, anything, how about the anti-gravity when you throw it in? But uh, this is why I love these, because OK, so what happened? Well, we did customer interviews door to door. We went to farmers markets online. And you know, here was what we told them. And what we learned was, all right, we need a bigger turbine. Uh, we're going to have to educate the market. Uh, we're going to need neighbors' approvals. And we really needed to understand customer archetypes. And you know, all right, um, these are who they are. And we did some market research. They actually did a wind map versus you know, power of um, uh, solar and wind proxies. They talked to industry experts. And what did they learn? Well, the customer acquisition cost was too high. Wind predictability was like um, kind of difficult. And they were really going to get their butts beat by solar in the residential market. And so what they did was they said, oops, that didn't work. So what did they do? They you know, said, well, wait a minute. Let's think about this. Why don't we put these turbines inside a lamppost? Well, if we're in lampposts, where not too many people have those in their backyards. Um, but why don't we target cities and help build the citywide distributed energy grid with an advantage over solar because it was local sustainable generation and it would pay and power the street lights and they could buy the lampposts for the city with, the, with a commitment to owning the energy uh, produced by the, uh, uh, by the towers. So their second business model, Canvas, said, well, we're going after cities. We're going to retrofit wind turbines for street and highway lamps. We're going to build a relationship with city engineers and council members. Um, and we needed to understand about the city approval process. So the cities were interested in financial options, long purchase cycles. Utilities were decoupled from this. Um, they had some barriers they needed to understand. And their final business model, Canvas, said, you know, we're going to go after cities and uh, developer utilities. We're going to do a leasing and power purchase authority um, uh, contracts rather than sell it. Um, and then our big um, uh, innovation here is we're going to partner with uh, financial institutions to go finance these. And uh, so here was their timeline, what they learned. Um, and they got two interested cities by the time they were done in the class, eight weeks. Um, Blah, blah, blah. That was some of their learnings. Startups are a roller coaster. Congratulations. Um, but I want to show you this. Week one, here was their business model. Week two, week three, week four, five, six, seven, eight. So now you could kind of take your learnings that you're doing with customer development and actually track them. Can I do one more real quick? Um, here was another class um, in a farm field in the Salinas Valley. Talked to 75 customers in eight weeks. Their original goal was, we're going to build a robot lawnmower for golf courses. These were true engineers. Right? It was very cool. They thought it was the cool, oh, well, this thing will be like you know, around the golfers and around. OK. All right? um, and we were going to build one. OK. So they went out, got their boots dirty, and interviewed uh, mowing and weeding companies, and basically found out that this was their first business model, as you can see, mowing, that their business really wasn't mowing. Their business was weeding. That farmers who had organic farms were really interested for a robot that could replace labor. 100 to 1 reduction. Organic farms are weeded by hand with immigrant labor stooping down and pulling out weeds. 
And the farmers would have been just incredibly happy if there was some way to automate this process. But no one believed it, including their teaching team that said, great guys, this is a nice theory, but you know, like who could build a machine vision device and a, you know, something to remove the weeds? You know, and they went, Professor Blank, we're Stanford engineers. <laughs> they built the carrot bot in a week. Had carrot bot. They built it, had an image recognition device, and they were about to put a surplus DARPA high power laser in it before I said, no, 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 for the purpose of the class, if you kill Fluffy, you know, <laughs> no one will forgive us. So why don't we assume that you could figure out how to kill the weeds? And so they actually went out to farms and were able to identify uh, in different lighting conditions in, in a week, which was a great head start, um, weeds. And so their business plan updated actually said, we're now a weeding service provider. And then they said, no, nah, we're going to be direct service, and, but we still have some technology and IP issues. And then they went out some more to the World Ag Expo, which usually doesn't occur at Stanford. And in this case, they had to drive 160 miles round trip to get to the Salinas Valley and back. Um, and then they said, well, I think we understand the technology, but we really need to understand the partners and the value. And they finally found a business model that says, we're going to charge by the acre with a modifier according to weed density. So we're out of time. I want to take a couple of questions as well. But uh, I hope this gives you kind of a view of customer development, lean startups, and where we're at. So thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Come on. Or we're going to give you a quiz, one of the two. <laughs> ah, good. All right. Uh, what is the story uh, that comes with a failure when people try to do the, mass, the, the customer validation and even though they were trying to do it, they weren't able to do it? Do you have a story like that? I'm, uh, I'm confused about the question. <clears throat> so suppose that I start a startup and I yep. want to find who my, who my customers are, right? And I put all the efforts and still I fail because I don't do it right. Do you have examples of these kind of companies? Not in my class. No, 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 seriously. So, uh, so failure takes two modes. And, 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 um, just, uh, um, and so rather than being glib, um, most of the startups in our class, because the other thing I don't show you is the teaching team had it easy. We assigned each team two experienced mentors, either an experienced entrepreneur or a VC, because the valley's dense with those people, or maybe just dense. Um, but um, what they did are either pivots, but two teams in the middle of the class did complete restarts. Complete restarts. Said, you know what? Th this business is not, doesn't have legs. It at least doesn't have legs for, for the... So that, to me, is kind of the, you know, the two ways you could go. I think there's a third way, which is the one that uh, I think is higher risk and actually uh, happens more often than not, is the founder comes back and says, everybody hated the product. Hated it. OK, what do you want to do? I still want to go for it. OK, now the distinction is, tell me why you believe the data is no good or not valid. Now, you've got to understand, when I talk about customer discovery and validation, it ain't a focus group. This isn't a vote. I'm not sending the founder out of the building so they could collect the sum of the features. That's what large companies do. What I'm sending people out of the building to do is inform artists' instinct. Founders are artists. The data may not be correct. It's the classic, you know, if you would have sent Henry Ford out on this thing, you would have got a faster horse. Right? But what he saw was what no one else saw about the data. That, you know, there was something else going on over here. But if you would have asked the customers if they wanted a car, that was a new market. You wouldn't have gotten a correct answer. Am I making sense or not? Right. So, so uh, uh, and, and in fact, if you, since you guys have read the book over there, market type plays real hard here. In an existing market, ignoring the data is really difficult because the market exists. The more it's a new market, the data might, may or may not be relevant to what your vision is and what you believe will emerge. Does that? All right, another question. Uh, thank you. 
I was just going to ask, don't you think the VCs fund already pivoted uh, founders? It seems like there's a lot of inherent no. trust in the founding team that you mention a lot. But I don't no. know if I always run into that. So, so ask it again. Are you asking, do they only fund experienced or? or well, it or, seems like that's something that's built into the kind of the lean startup model is this trust by the capital, the people who own the capital with the founding team. So that, that you allow the founding team the time to I see. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Um, if I got your question correctly, is let me point out that five years ago, talking about pivots and whatever to a board member would have got you fired. Fired. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, that's nice. Go do the go do the business plan we signed up for. Literally in the span of five years, if you're doing a web or mobile app, or a software app, every VC in the valley at least will give lip service to customer development and lean startup. Some of them actually know what it means. Okay, um, it's it's not quite there in other markets, but in a good number of them, they'll now give you some some rope to hang yourself with only because the cycle time is so fast and the cash burn is so low. Because what they're betting on is great, go experiment here, you know, knock yourself out on your first half a million dollars. We're only putting in five million bucks when you found the repeatable model, right? Facebook's and, and Twitter and whatever are raising these huge piles of cash after they found the scalable model. And by the way, scalable model for social networks at first isn't revenue, right? It's a multi-sided market. At first they were building networks of tens then hundreds of millions of users and then monetizing those users. Fred Wilson's model in Union Square, was, that was the investment strategy. Did that answer your question or not? All right. Okay, Lee. You, you asked us to remind you uh, to explain why you think we're on the verge of a new bubble in clean tech. Yeah, so clean tech has this funny uh, characteristic is yeah, 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 we're excited, this is great, but thanks for telling us all about a business we're not in, because, you know, clean tech, by the way, as, any, as you guys know, any, we're from building wind turbines to nanocells, solar, to, you know, all kinds of devices, but it tends to be more capital intensive than I'm starting a company in half a million bucks. And when the financial crash happened in 2008, all the capital got nervous and went away, just went away for scale, right? If you were smart, like Elon Musk, you figured out how to, you know, suck another half a billion dollars out of the government and, you know, he managed to do it for two companies, so it is possible. Um, but for the rest of companies, stuff just kind of like stalled. The evidence I have that the smart money is now going to play in this scale game again for clean tech is uh, something you should watch. There's a VC in Silicon Valley named Adam Grosser who used to be at Foundation Capital. He just left and raised a clean tech essentially scale fund. Not seed stage and not, you know, the end financial stage, but how to do build outs. He just raised $1.3 billion for a clean tech scale fund. It's called Silver Lake Craft Works. Um, I just spoke to another VC in this space, and he said that just made the rest of us look like idiots uh, because we've been sitting on our money and it looks like it might be time to start raising big funds again because Adam just has shown that he didn't raise a hundred million dollar fund or two one point three billion dollars and he was oversubscribed so my theory is by the fourth quarter of this year you're gonna see billions of dollars back in again at the risk capital stage just in time for you guys to graduate and start doing this stuff that won't only just be let's fund the first round of new technology ideas and new whatever ideas but what was stopping those was, yeah, well, when we get you funded, we can't follow on with the next couple hundred million bucks. I think that's going to be back again. That's my prediction. Lee, does that answer your question? Just a prediction. Yes? When you're targeting customers, um, trying to differentiate based on like a social or environmental mission, how does that, that change? Because the, the products you've been talking about are solving like a true customer problem, like right. they're innovations. Right. So. so so the first question I ask, are you for-profit or non-profit? Uh, non-profit, essentially. Right. Um, well, I, just, I take that back. Let's say for-profit, because it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I, I'm just, as an aside, 
I've sat in board meetings where I couldn't tell. Um, and that's a bad thing. In fact, sometimes I ask for-profit companies, maybe we just ought to declare you guys a 501c3 and I wouldn't be confused about what we're doing here. Um, by the way, your ambivalence, and I don't mean you, but is, is a real problem in the nonprofit world, right? Is are we kind of entrepreneurs, but we're not going to make money on purpose, or are we trying to change the world? Or, or no, no, seriously, um, social entrepreneurship is awesome, but sometimes gets confused about what the goal is and what methods we're using to do it. Are we going to be a for-profit company that's going to do good, or are we going to be a nonprofit company that you know is doing good, but we're going to have to find a different way to make money? And, and so. Um, it, it, I'm trying to give you a short answer to a very long and complicated question. I sit on the board of a bunch of nonprofits, and I uh, and I coach social entrepreneurship students um, in spite of my good instincts. Not not because I don't think the effort isn't worthy. It's just um, it's just much harder because the, in fact it would look easier than startups, regular for-profit startups. It's about 10x harder um, because while you might have vision and passion and maybe even the ability not to take a salary for a couple of years. You're dealing with other people. In Anybody ever worked with other people in traditional nonprofits who've been there for 10 or 20 years? I mean, they're making you know the paychecks you know half the size of my secretary. And they're doing it for much different reasons. But their motivations and their ability to be agile and effective on the way a startup can, it's not the same game. And so there are these impedance match, what I would call impedance matching issues of passion and agility, and let's go change this and this when it meets like traditional nonprofits. Um, so it's a longer story. I'm happy to go have coffee and talk about it. Um, I, I'm, as you can tell, a little conflicted in, in that um, um, I, I believe we could change the world. I believe we still haven't figured out a coherent model that does that in a way that. Um, guarantees some long-term success. It's a whole thing about what metrics do you measure, how do you measure them, what is success, is it, gee, we got, it, we got something here. Classic is lots of social entrepreneurs, Ghana seems to be the place of choice. Anybody go to Ghana for their, yeah, okay, seems to be that's where everybody goes. It's the classic, you build a well, great, I built a well, the villagers were happy, whatever, I leave, what do you think happens? Come back a year later. They haven't used it since you were there. You forgot that in the village, unless you understood the culture, you actually had to have this person be the operator of the well. And the, I mean, and so that's much more difficult than just doing a startup with metrics that are either users or money, et cetera. And I, I will talk to you some more about that. Yes. Have you ever been part of a business where the investors were required to accept some kind of, um, you know, pro bono efforts from the company so that you wouldn't get sued for not maximizing your profits? What was the last part? Well, the investors are often primarily concerned about making a profit, but what if you have some altruistic aspect of your business so that the founders or the, the folks that are managing it don't get sued eventually so they, by the so less sued and more so what kind of investors do you have and, and more so who are you and where are you focused on, on your time. Um, I've never been part of one. I probably would never invest in one. Um, there's, it really goes up to a higher level of strategy. That is, do you want to do good by first doing well in your life or do you want to do well in your life by doing good for your life? Does that make it? They're very different. I have personally not seen too many successful models that combine the two, personally. And I know we could all list Ben and Jerry's and the others that have, but, but I think, personally, I think they're corner cases. I think you need to do one at a time, or else you get your butt kicked by other people in, in, in your markets who are not playing with the handicaps you've decided to assign to yourself. That's a personal opinion. Others have clearly different opinions. I'm not suggesting what I'm just saying is right or wrong. It happened to be how I managed my, my personal career. I decided I was going to do well, you know, and then when I retired, I said, well, that's enough. Okay. Now, you know, our foundation takes care of nonprofits, and I, my last 10 years have been giving back. But I don't think I ever could have 
one because it is a zero-sum game when you're doing a startup. Uh, there are people not playing by rules that you might decide to do, and I will consider those handicapped, not suggesting they're the wrong social goals, but, it's, but that's not how you're being measured or scored or won or whatever. And, and it's just kind of a crime to find it all collapsing because you really couldn't keep both plates spinning. Uh, did I mix enough metaphors there? Or, uh, did, did that answer a question? I mean, at least, I, 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 and, and by the way, I want to be clear. It's not the answer. It happens to be my personal one. Yeah. So you were talking about the potential for a bubble yep. in the clean tech, and you also mentioned mobile, which I'm personally interested in. But um, more importantly, can I just cl ask you a clarifying question? So when you said that there's a bubble, it changes what your goal is as an entrepreneur, okay. but not necessarily. So I left those slides out. Okay. Um, so um, what, I, what I have now suggested to startups I'm talking to um, is you still need, in this new bubble, unlike the old one, this isn't going to win on hype. Right? This, the winners are going to be companies that build customers or revenue or whatever, period. End of discussion. The distinction is what I used to tell, and this again, my bias, what I used to tell people for the last 10 years, if I see you hire a PR agency, I'll break your legs and ask for my money back. Because I don't want you to hype anything. There's no per point of it. There's no IPO market. And I don't want you to go for an M&A until you build a substantial company. Now my advice is slightly different, slightly. You, st you, you are not going to be successful just hyping nothing. You need to build revenue and customers, period. But for the first time, I'm suggesting, you know what? You might want to make sure that you are known in whatever segment you're playing in for either acquirers or eventually some other liquidity event, but certainly for acquirers. And let's take it a step further. In every segment you're in, let's say you were in the hotel management segment, you were building software, you should know the top 10 companies who are buying other companies. Okay, in those 10 companies are names of real people who are the head of their biz dev department. You ought to know what they read, what trade shows they go to, and who influences them. And your job for the next two years, while you're building your company, while whatever, is to make sure those people know who you are. Another trick of knowing who they are is find out who their most important customers are and steal them. Right? So all that's on the path of growing large, but now there's an additional strategy in a bubble. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So those are the slides I didn't show you because I didn't want to corrupt everybody in here. To, you know, start thinking about flipping a company before you even think about building a company. Build a, this time it's going to be build companies. The question is what you build in the social mobile space, by the way. You're not building typically revenues first. You're p building networks of users, scale. Right? You might build revenue, but the, the one I didn't understand and I now really appreciate is you could get to hundreds of millions of customers and monetization will follow. Answer your question? Okay. Um, I guess... Uh, well, you got two parts. Sorry. So I want to give I two parts? I do that sometimes. Right. So I apologize. Um, so the whole concept of a bubble for clean tech um, for people in this room that are interested mm -hmm. in engineering and helping the environment mm -hmm. seems kind of like a scary thing, even though... As an entrepreneur, it seems like a good thing because you know you're going to be selling your company. Bubble implies right. big boom at the end. Right. Um, so is here's that what you're predicting. Too? No, I, I'm talking about a bubble in funding and acquisitions. You could always decide not to participate. Now, there's there's two things, particularly in clean tech, you ought to know, um, which is different in here than any other time, any other place. And while this might seem obvious to you, it wasn't obvious to the financial people in the 2008 crash. In the last year in the United States, there were over, over 2,000 pieces of what we could call clean tech legislation passed, state, federal, local, requiring, mandating, needing, etc. It's dawning on everybody, certainly you guys got it here first at Brent, but it's dawning on everybody, this ain't a fad. It's not going away. Clean tech in all its forms, Wind, solar, you know, any nanomaterials, you know, it doesn't matter. Everything, biomass, it's here to stay. 
it will become more and more an integral part of our, com uh, our country and our economy. That is new news. And while you guys go, duh, it's important to understand that the financial people didn't quite get that. And now all of a sudden, you know, what happened today? Governor Brown signed the 33% uh, mandate for electricity needs to be, 33% of our electricity needs to be uh, come from renewable sources. And he just approved that huge sun power plant in somewhere in California. I think it was California. This stuff is going to be, you know, instead of an exceptional announcement, this is going to be an ever-increasing set of things. The bubble I referred to it was not that, but the fact that financing is now going to open up again, my prediction, just a prediction, on a scale we haven't seen in a while. And that mergers and acquisitions and, uh, and other things will happen in the clean tech business like you haven't seen since you guys, before you came to school. Here's another piece of advice that works for you guys and everybody else in the room. And, and uh, how many of you are still in school? How many of you are still in school? I'm going to tell you a bad piece of news. You take money for an investor, and you've made a deal with the devil. Right? Not, not as bad. Not, this isn't horrible news. But you're no longer pure. And by no longer pure, it means your agenda is no longer your agenda. Your agenda has to match your investor's agenda. And if you don't understand that your investor's agenda, in most cases, is not how to make the world a better place. It is how to make a bigger pile of money from the small pile of money I gave you. Now, maybe some of your money might all be coming from sources that actually do care about that. But your interests now need to be aligned with your investor's interests. And it's a mistake most entrepreneurs, not just first time, but long term entrepreneurs make, is not understanding what do they want? And why are they giving me this money? Because you might want to save the world, and they're going, yeah, well, that's nice. Uh, did we reach our 100 times return yet on investment? Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Going once. Oh. How do you know, when you're engaging in customer development, how do you know when to believe the data? And how do you know when to say, screw it and keep on going anyways? You know, remember the title of the talk? why accountants don't run startups, right? If it was all data driven, we would have accountants running startups. A couple of things. On a very tactical level, you know, the web now allows us to do all kinds of surveys, you know, online, and gee, look at all this information I got. And what, with all due respect, I don't believe any of it. So when my students come back with internet data, I want to understand how it correlated with what I call how big did their pupils dilate data. Meaning, I want to look at you personally when I'm asking you the questions or watching your reaction to a product or something. So on one level, I need to, uh, it's okay to do web surveys, but I need some kind of correlation factor between I ask those questions in pur on purpose, excuse me, in person, versus I ask them online. Two is, um, to me, the most valid data is when you have enough to be actually draw two things. One is a customer archetype. A customer, you know, when you get data, it, let's say you're running a website, it all looks like data. But inside the data is people. And usually you will find that you have one, two, three, maybe four different types of customers in that data. You need to be able to put up, I just saw somebody do this today, picture on the wall representing who they are, how old are they, what do they buy, what do they think, what do they do for their jobs, etc. That's an archetype. You know, psychographic, demographic, whatever data. And you're building the product for those people. Two is, for me, the real test for discovery and validation is, here's a pen, go up the whiteboard, tell me the day in the life of the archetype. Well, Steve, I told you their archetype is, no, 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 thanks, you got me to step one. Tell me what they did from when they got up in the morning. What kind of car did they drive? What do they eat for breakfast? They read any newspapers? When they went to work, who do they interact with? Yeah, I know who they work with, but who do they really interact with? They use a computer? Great, Mac or PC. What do they have open on their screen all day? 
Oh, you're selling them an app? What other apps do they have open? And how often do they use your app versus someone? Does that make sense? When you, and of course, it's impossible to get this in one, two, three, even 20 meetings. But when you feel comfortable enough that we really understand enough about the customer to have kind of that kind of conversation, then we could say, so remember the value proposition, your features and whatever? Do they match any of those people that you think, great, did any of them say, holy cow, give it to me now or I'll give you a check or a credit card but you're not leaving the room until I have, they didn't? Well, why not? Am I making sense? So it's not like, and 42.3.7% said we'd use it. Nah, that's what accountants do. Your job as the founder is to get an ear for, you know, did I find a segment where, wow, there's some part of these people that just won't let me leave. In fact, they're willing to write checks now or play with it now, et cetera. Does that, now by the way, that's a category that solves problems. Typically business to business apps. There's another category of products that don't fit in that at all. And those are those that play to human needs. Anybody play Angry Birds? Right, you wanna admit it? Right. It's the biggest suck of like human you know, hours in the United States today. It's decreased productivity in the US probably by 9%. Now what problem does Angry Birds solve? Right, but it's not really a, you know, a business problem, right? It's a human need. It's, you know, you want to be entertained, no? Entertainment is a human need. What, is, what problem does Facebook solve? To who? Yeah, used to be in the old days when I was your age, isn't that a great phrase, when I was your age, right? We used to do that face to face. I know that's hard to believe, but we used to get out from our computers and mobile devices and actually talk to each other. And it turns out there's a whole class of products which you should think about if anybody's thinking about startup ideas that are mediating all the old things or hardwired things that human beings need socially. Computers first disconnected us and are now reconnecting us physical connection, entertainment, sex, you know. You make your list of things that human beings used to do physically are now all being moved online. And there's a whole set of opportunities, confession, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so those are different than products that solve problems, right? A problem is essentially a return on investment thing, which I was first discussing. All right, sorry, I got off in a rat hole. Anything else? Did I completely confuse you? Well, since I'm the host and I have the microphone, oh, okay. <laughs> I get to ask the last right. question. Uh, this week in class, we've been talking about Moore's chasm, crossing the chasm from yep. your visionary customers to your mainstream customers. Yep. What advice would you give as they're doing their customer discovery and looking into pricing for pricing for your visionary versus the mainstream as you're discovering both even early on in the process? and seeing that there's two distinct customers with you know, different pricing preferences. So, you know, I always thought um, when I started uh, doing discovery for the first time, I always used to be depressed, and this was in enterprise software, that only one out of 20 people, one out of 20, would even want to engage in a conversation. Because I was always taught that, gee, everybody you talk to ought to be an order or a sale or whatever. It turns out that that number, actually that 5%, that really is those early adopter things, if you're looking at Moore's uh, uh, diagram, to the left of the chasm. Those are the people that will engage in you. And the really interesting thing is those other 19, I finally understood they weren't saying no, even though they thought they were. They were saying no, not now. And so that was okay. So then I just mentally said, oh, I get it. I'm coming back to you. You just don't know you need me now, but you're still on my list made me at least feel good. And so the real question was, you know, should you charge more or less for the early adopters? Now, the historical way to do this is you thought of these as beta customers, right? And how much did people charge for beta, early use? Nothing. So I have to tell you my experience was you really don't understand whether you have early adopters or what I call the early evangelist 
until you tell them, no, 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 we don't have beta. Engineering has that. That's the buggy, unfinished product. <coughs> what we have is an early access program. Um, there's a limited number of people we're taking, and it's full price. What? You're going to charge me full price for a, that same unfinished, buggy product? Listen, if it's not important to you, that's okay. We'll be back in nine months. You know, now all of a sudden, you've just done another filter. <coughs> the other filter is finding out what I wanted to find out is who am I going to spend time with? Who will forgive my mistakes? When it's free, they could shove it under the door and doesn't, you know, or in their closet. It really doesn't matter. That happened to me once, actually. Gave it away, ended up in a closet. It's really embarrassing. Um, and these are people who like me. So that's the short answer. Um, but there's no right answer. On that high note. On that note. All right. Uh, on behalf of the Bren School and our Go Entrepreneurship students, I want to thank you and give you a small gift. Oh, great. Thank you.